Okay, so yeah. Um, first, I guess I want to thank the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk and for everyone sticking around for the very last talk. And yeah, sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, yeah, I hope everyone's had a great week and I look forward to watching some of the lectures that I was too uh, asleep to attend um, on YouTube later. Um, but okay, yeah, so let's get into the talk. Yeah, so today um, I want to talk about um, some sort of uh, conjectures around resurgence uh, associated to some asymptotic series that uh, come from, uh, on one hand, uh, quantum invariance of three manifolds and sort of more generally um, proper Q-hypergeometric functions. And so we'll start by sort of giving a little introduction to these series. Um, and so one can sort of define these series uh, from more generally than just from a three manifold, but from just sort of the data of some integer symplectic matrices. Um, and so we'll give that sort of definition. And then I'll go on to uh, some associated state integrals of, uh, that are associated to similar objects as these uh, asymptotic series. So these are sort of uh, yeah, again, sort of a generalization of the constructions of Anderson and Kashaev um, to, again, in, uh, sort of more general things than just the three manifold context. Uh, and then I'll talk about quantum modularity of all these objects and then how that ties into resurgence uh, finally. Okay. So let's start off with the symplectic matrices and the asthmatic series. So yeah, this all sort of starts off uh, with Witten's interpretation of Jones's invariant of links. So in the 80s, Jones discovered this uh, link invariant and Witten interpreted it in terms of quantum field theory. And so he interpreted this invariant as some kind of exponential integral, um, but over some infinite dimensional space of connections. Uh, so Witten would write an expression like this, where we integrate AM is sort of the space of SU2 connections on a three manifold M, uh, G is the gauge group. And so we integrate over connections modulo gauge um, associated with this uh, exponential measure here, where we take the churn simons invariant of the connection divided by two pi I H bar. Okay, so because the churn simons invariant is only defined modulo two pi I squared, um, Witten's uh, invariant sort of quantizes this H bar, I mean, to make sense of this integral. Um, and so Witten associated this integral with Jones's invariant at these specific sort of quantized values of H bar. Um, okay, and so, but if we take a step back and just look at this integral, if this was a finite dimensional integral, then we'd expect to get nice asymptotic series uh, associated to this when we send H bar to zero. Um, and those should be sort of determined by the critical points of this churn simons functional. And in this case, the critical points are flat SL2C connections which sort of complexify. Um, and here, uh, the, yeah, this is now a finite dimensional space. So that's actually quite nice. And so we can really computationally get a handle on these uh, critical points. Um, and so the way that uh, this is done in practice. So the way that for given a three manifold, you look at these SL2C connections is sort of using uh, ideas of Thurston. And so Thurston would triangulate uh, a hyperbolic manifold into sort of ideal uh, tetrahedra. So say if we take a knot complement, for example, um, we would triangulate this with ideal tetrahedra and sort of construct these connections locally on each tetrahedron and build it up into a connection on the three manifold. Um, and so, yeah, so the hyperbolic tetrahedra we can describe very easily. Their moduli space is very simple. It's just the upper half plane modulo um, uh, Z mod three Z action. Um, and so here uh, we get some nice moduli space of these tetrahedra. Uh, and then we want to understand sort of when we can glue these together. But yeah, for now, just the tetrahedra, you know, it look, will look something like this. So for each of these parameters, this Z, Z prime, Z double prime, basically the geometry of this tetrahedron is determined by, um, yeah, so on one aspect, the angle along this edge of the tetrahedron will be determined by the argument of this Z, uh, and then there'll be some sort of torsion associated to the length. Um, and what's nice about this uh, moduli space is we can easily compute uh, the volume of such a tetrahedra uh, using the block of Wigner dialogarithm. Um, and so here, uh, 
yeah, it's exactly just equal to the evaluation of this sort of moduli Z of the block Wigner. Um, and so we can compute volumes or complexified uh, volumes using some kind of dilogarithm function. So the block Wigner for specifically the volume associated to uh, a triangulation and then uh, yeah, more generally complexified volumes for um, some other kind of dilogarithm values. But okay, so that's sort of the local structure on each tetrahedron. And so we have this moduli, we can describe them, but uh, when we want to glue them together to make a hyperbolic three manifold, um, we need to understand sort of how these things will glue together geometrically. So um, because we're dealing with ideal tetrahedron, topologically, we glue along faces and there's no issue here. And because uh, for ideal tetrahedra, we, move, we remove the vertices. And this is the only thing that can cause us trouble when, we are cons when we're gluing tetrahedra together. And so therefore, um, we'll get a nice topological space. And we just need to understand basically which moduli can patch together um, to give us a geometric structure uh, on the three manifold. Um, and so the main uh, constructions of Thurston is basically we look at, so each of these ideal tetrahedra, we need to glue them via an isometry of uh, hyperbolic three space. And these isometries exactly SL2C. Uh, and so then uh, if you sort of choose your basis correctly, so you send sort of one of the vertices or say, so let's focus on an edge and we're trying to glue tetrahedra around that edge. Uh, then we can sort of fix the two edges in a particular model at zero and say infinity for this ideal tetrahedron. And then this sort of turns the uh, monodromy that we would like to glue, um, or the monodromy we would use to glue these tetrahedra together uh, into sort of an abelian version. So it'll be upper triangular and, or sorry, yes, upper triangular, say. Uh, and we can really see the monodromy around this edge, which topologically is just a contractible loop, therefore it should vanish. And we can write that monodromy vanishing in terms of these moduli as some simple equations like this. Um, so here, uh, yeah, it's just this nice monomials in Z, uh, our parameters ZJ, our moduli for each tetrahedra, if we have capital N tetrahedra uh, and one minus ZJ. And then all of the gluing equations is determined by these integer matrices, A and B, and then some vector of signs nu. Okay. So these, um, these are Thurston's gluing equations. Um, and the data of these gluing equations is often called Neumann Zagier data. Um, and uh, Neumann Zagier showed that these matrices actually have a, a surprising symplectic property. So in particular, um, if you take A times B transposed, this is a symmetric matrix. And if we sort of take A uh, and B as an N by two N matrix, then this is full rank over Q. They actually show a little more, it's full rank over sort of a half times Z in some sense. So there's, there's just a half that floats around, but it's essentially, it's almost full rank over Z, but... Uh, there's an extra half that sneaks in at some point. Okay. So yeah, so if we go back to Witten's integral, um, this was an infinite dimensional integral um, over a space of connections. And we said that it should be determined asymptotically at least by the critical points of this churn simons functional, which were the flat connections. Um, but actually we can reduce this in some sense, or it's believed that it can be reduced. I don't think um, there's a sort of known physical argument uh, to do this, but in practice, um, people have had success in constructing something that could potentially be a reduction of this infinite dimensional integral. Um, but anyway, so from work of Kashaev in the mid nineties, um, we expect this to be able to be reduced. And so basically we would like to sort of perform Witten's integral over tetrahedron, uh, tetrahedra, uh, and then glue those uh, integrals together because that um, Witten's invariant is local. The Chern Simons functional is all local. So we should be able to glue these sort of quantum invariants together to get the full thing. Um, but so what's expected to happen is that when you do this integral sort of over a tetrahedron, you get some kind of quantum dialogarithm associated to each tetrahedron. Each tetrahedron. 
Um, and so the quantum die logarithm um, was given by uh, Fadeev and then studied uh, by Kashaev and who used it to go on to construct three manifold invariants. Um, but so in the form that I like, it's this quotient of two Pockhammer symbols. So here, um, do I give it? No. So here Q is e to the two pi i b squared and Q tilde is e to the two pi i um, divide, uh, minus one divided by uh, b squared. Um, and so here there's sort of a modular flavor already that we can see. Um, this is essentially evaluation of a, some kind of infinite Pockhammer symbol at tau and then divided by its value at minus one over tau. Um, okay, so this is the quantum die logarithm. It has many different formulas. We'll see another one later. Uh, and this has a nice asymptotic series, um, which uh, is sort of determined by just one of these Pockhammer symbols. So I'll just give you the asymptotics of the Pockhammer symbol here. And so you see that the leading order in this asymptotic series uh, is given by um, the dialogarithm. And so this is maybe one reason called a quantum dialogarithm. Uh, there's many more reasons, but that's the sort of zero order reason. Um, okay, so then, yeah, so we take these quantum dialogarithms and we associate them to each tetrahedra. We take a big product of them and then we integrate over some finite dimensional space. And it's expected that this should be related to these sort of quantum invariants in some way. So Hikami uh, sort of initiated this study after Kashaev and then uh, many others worked on this and it was sort of uh, put on very firm footing by Anderson and Kashaev, um, who gave very precise contours of integration and uh, proved invariance of... Uh, yeah, of their construct of their invariants of these state integrals. Um, but okay, we won't go into that directly. We're still on the asymptotic series. Um, so yeah, the state integrals we can roughly think uh, are a Gaussian measure at times a product of these Fedeyev quantum dial logarithms. And this Gaussian measure is determined uh, not by just the critical points themselves, but the equations that determine the critical points. So in particular, if we have this neumann zagier data A and B, then our Gaussian measure will be something like B inverse A, and then we will take a product of Fedeyevs for each of the tetrahedra uh, in the triangulation. Uh, and so this is the kind of invariant Anderson Kashaev give many more details, but here I'm not sort of interested in constructing the three manifold invariants. I'm just interested in the behavior of these, um, the asymptotic series of these kind of integrals and their analytic properties. Okay. Uh, and so how is this related back to the flat connections? Well, so here we need to take these integrals and now we have a finite dimensional integral and we can try and apply something like stationary phase. Um, and so this was studied in detail by many people. So one uh, paper of note is Demovtogukov, Lenil Zagier, um, who gave many exact results uh, uh, for these sort of perturbative expansions and use various, I think, three different kinds of methods to construct uh, a certain asymptotic series that come from this uh, stationary phase applied to these state integrals. Uh, and then Demofta and Garifalidis gave a sort of uh, formalized all of this and gave a precise definition in terms of the neumann zagier data uh, and sort of formal Gaussian integration. Um, and so, yeah, so in particular, they start with this neumann zagier data, which was this uh, AB matrix that we saw before, determined by these gluing equations and this sine vector nu. And they start with a so-called combinatorial flattening, um, this sort of integral solution. So F and F double prime are some integer vectors, and they solve this uh, sort of linear version of the gluing equations. And Z will be a solution to the gluing equations that we saw before. So a vector of uh, yeah, not complex numbers, say. And so when the determinant of B is not equal to zero, um, then they defined asymptotic series in this way. So we take this product of these formal series, uh, psi sub h bar of x of z. So this was the asymptotics of the Fedeyev quantum die logarithm. So this formal series here. Um, so we take this series, uh, and we just take a product with this little exponential prefactor. So you can see here the dependence on f of this uh, of this big Gaussian integral is just this h bar over eight uh, term here. Uh, so it's quite uh, it's not a very strong dependence. Um, 
and we perform the Gaussian integral around the sort of critical point Z. Um, okay, so then here, uh, so recently uh, with Garofalidis and Stotzer, we actually showed that uh, taking this definition of Demofter and Garofalidis, you can prove that these asymptotic series are invariants of the three manifold for the special solution to the gluing equations uh, that comes from the geometric uh, solution. So if we have a hyperbolic knot complement, uh, then you can define this series and we prove this is a topological invariant of the knot. Okay, so these are the kind of series that I'll be interested in studying their, um, their resurgent properties and their asymptotics. And so just for a quick example, a very easy example, um, if we take the figure eight knot for one, then, uh, then you can find some neumann zagier data given as follows. So you just have this collection of uh, integral matrices and you can choose a solution to these equations. Oh, sorry. Well, there is the geometric solution to these equations is uh, Z1 and Z2 equals the sixth root of unity. And so if we just start with that formula and apply uh, a, a particular identity to the quantum dialog logarithm, we can reduce this to a one dimensional Gaussian integral. So here, this is extremely simple. Every time we see an X, we just replace it by uh, an X to the N, we just replace it by uh, an N double factorial uh, with a square root of minus three to some power. Uh, if it's odd and otherwise, uh, if it's even, it vanishes. Uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. Um, okay. And yeah, in this example, you can compute, uh, you know, hundreds of coefficients. And so here are just the first 10 um, where I've removed sort of the, all the prefactors. So the series starts with one. Okay, and so this is sort of a typical example of these things. And so you can really compute a lot of these terms or well, even the order of hundreds. Um, but yeah, as I said at the start, there's no need to take a particular three manifold. So for, for one, um, the neumann zagier data of a three manifold, these A and B matrices will be quite sparse in general. They'll be, their entries will be at minimum minus two and at maximum two, and often they'll be zero. Um, but we can define these series for more general A and B. Any upper half symplectic matrix will do, and we can construct some uh, asymptotic series for this. So really, we're just starting with this combinatorial data and then this algebraic solution. So we need a little more. Uh, and then we can construct uh, these asymptotic series. And all the proofs that we gave um, with uh, Garofalidis and Storza, they'll go through for these uh, this data. So if you apply there's sort of some combinatorial equivalences that come from certain equivalences between triangulations of three manifolds. So in particular, a two, three Pachner move. So if you have a stack of two tetrahedra and then you split it into three, uh, this will give you a different expression for uh, these gluing equations and you can track that. And so that gives you some combinatorial move between the this data. Uh, and all of these moves, uh, these series are invariant um, under these moves. So even if we don't start with the three manifold, we still have sort of a bunch of equivalence relations between this combinatorial data plus a little algebraic. Um, and all of our asymptotic series will be invariant under these. But so here, uh, to define the Gaussian integration, you do need a non-degenerate quadratic form. So for the geometric connection, so for that theorem, we had a hyperbolic manifold, uh, it has a geometric connection. And for this uh, example uh, of combinatorial data and algebraic solution, uh, the quadratic form that would appear as in the Gaussian integral is non-degenerate. And so therefore you can really construct this series, but in general, this might not be the case and you have to work a little harder to def even define the asymptotic series. Um, but in that case, there is a little work um, that I've done with uh, Garofalidis. This is a period, uh, this is a paper that appeared at the end of last year, um, starts periods, the meromorphic uh, 3D index and the triburo invariant. Uh, and so the, in these examples, uh, so in the previous examples where we have a non-degenerate um, quadratic form, these all give rise to sort of asymptotic series with algebraic coefficients. Um, but more generally, when we have some positive dimensional uh, locus of critical points, 
in examples, then we start to see periods of these uh, loci appearing uh, in, as coefficients in the asymptotic series. And so in the examples of this paper, we had, um, yeah, we had uh, basically the critical points associated to the objects we were looking at. Um, they were located at the A polynomial of an associated knot. And so then the asymptotic series we're seeing, uh, we're seeing periods of this A polynomial appear. But so in more generally, these are the, the kind of things that would appear um, if you're not in the ideal situation where you have a non-degenerate um, critical point. But okay. So that's just to introduce you to these series, give you a, a, a little flavor for where they show up in three manifold topology and uh, their invariance. Okay, so now let's dive into the state integrals in a little more detail and how they relate to Q-hypergeometric sums. Okay, so the state integrals we saw before, they have a natural um, analog uh, for sort of Q-hypergeometric sums, either as elements of the Herbero ring or as Q-series. Uh, so in particular, these are two different uh, objects that will have asymptotics determined or the same kind of asymptotics as these formal Gaussian integrals that we gave at the start. And so to prove these kind of asymptotic statements, uh, you can do this in practice for examples and uh, small enough examples, you can do it. So basically the, the main idea is that you need to take these sums and you want to apply some summation method, but then you need to justify that all the boundary terms are small enough. And then your summation method will turn these into some kind of integral. And then you want to justify use of the saddle point method. So in examples, uh, these kind of asymptotics can be done, but in general, you know, it just depends on the geometry of sort of the critical points and uh, to do that in general is a little harder, but in, in an example, you can sort of prove that these kind of sums will have uh, the asymptotics that we have to start just sort of by formally hoping that we could apply stationary phase to a sum. Um, and so these kind of sums are actually quite general. So here it looks very specific, you know, we have a product. So these Pockhamma symbols here that have appeared, they're a product of, um, you know, n Pockhammer symbols. So these are vector, uh, these k's are vectors. So, um, you know, they're a product of n Pockhammer symbols, but all very just straight Pockhammers. There's nothing crazy going on. No linear forms appearing uh, in the arguments of the Pockhammer symbols. Um, but these sums are actually quite general because we can always take um, a Pockhammer symbol and turn it into one of the sums of these forms by uh, using the Q binomial theorem. So if, in particular, if we have a Pockhammer symbol in the numerator of a Q hypergeometric sum, we can always put it into the denominator, just the clean Pockhammer L here with, you know, the catch of introducing an extra sum and similarly in the denominator. So therefore, these kind of sums, if we consider proper Q hypergeometric <laughs> sums, they'll sort of always be able to be reduced to um, something of this form that I considered on the previous page here. So in particular, these Q series, definitely we can always reduce to something of this form. Um, okay. So then, um, yeah, okay. So we have these, we have these sums, we have these state integrals and sort of the question is how they're related. Um, so these state integrals can often be factorized into sort of two objects. So we saw that the FIDE of uh, dialogism itself was factorized into sort of um, into two pieces, one that depended on Q, if Q is E to the two pi i tau, and one that depended on Q tilde, E to the minus one over tau. Um, and this factorization uh, also happens for these state integrals in general. And so this was sort of known in the physics literature, for example, there's this work of Beam de Mokto Paschetti. Um, and this was explicitly proved uh, for you know, a large class of examples by um, Garifalidis and Kashaev in two papers. Uh, and the reason that there were two papers um, was that there's sort of two cases that you need to deal with uh, and it sort of behaves differently in either case. So in particular, we can either have um, you know, this argument tau uh, b squared, uh, if we're thinking in terms of the Fedeev that I gave previously, this can either be in the complex numbers anywhere but the real, so the upper and lower half planes, or it can be at a rational point. Uh, and so these two cases correspond to these two papers that I just mentioned. Um, okay, and so if we go into 
the upper half plane, uh, then basically the way that we would factorize a state integral <laughs> is simply by using, you know, sort of undergraduate complex analysis uh, and collect residues. We just have a contour and we push it to infinity and collect residues. Uh, and so then the main point that we need to understand is just keep track of the poles and zeros of the Fideyev quantum bar logarithm. Uh, but with this formula that I gave as a definition, um, this is extremely easy. So here it's a product formula. We can see exactly where all the poles and zeros are. Uh, and so here, you know, we're going to have poles in this upper half plane and uh, zeros in the lower. Um, and then we have these sort of cones out here where uh, nothing is happening. And so if we have a contour along the reals, we sort of often push it to the positive infinity and just catch these poles. And this will give us a double sum uh, because it's a sum over a, a two-dimensional cone. Okay, so then let's just look at some examples. Um, so this uh, is a state integral for the figure eight knot. So if you remember back to the asymptotic series that I gave, we had a formal Gaussian integral of square of this asymptotic series associated to the Fadeyev. Uh, and then it was, uh, you know, with some Gaussian form. And so here, this is exactly the same, uh, you know, the Fadeyev quantum dialog rhythm squared appearing is for exactly the same reason. Um, and so here, this one on the left is the anderson kashaev state integral, or at least a reduction of it. Uh, and then the one on the right is a state integral that we introduced uh, with uh, Marcos, Gia, and Stavros um, in a paper from two years ago, I guess now. Uh, and so these can be factorized again using this uh, sort of residue calculus. So the first one factorizes this nice bilinear product of two series, G1 and G0. Uh, and the second uh, factorizes in a similar way with a G2 and then you have the G1 and G0 and then some additional functions appearing. Um, so these functions here are all nice q hypergeometric functions. Um, this G1, G2, G0, you can, these higher order terms sort of appear. Um, you can think if you're familiar with differential equations, then, uh, or q difference equations, the, basically, they're sort of some kind of Frobenius deformation of the G0 series. So if we solve a certain q difference equation associated to G0, then G1 and G2 would sort of be like the logarithmic solutions uh, if we were talking about differential equations. But here it's Q difference. So we see these sort of Eisenstein series appearing here. Um, okay, so yeah, so you can completely do this. It's all very um, clear for simple enough examples here. We just have one dimensional integral, um, but so you can explicitly calculate it and um, yeah, factorize these state integrals as these sort of bilinear product of Q and Q tilde objects. Um, okay, so that's in a case where we can push the contour to infinity, but this is not always possible. So there might, of course, if you want to push the contour to infinity, you want it to vanish at infinity, this contour, or at least this integral, sorry. Um, but this might not be the case for certain state integrals that we might want to consider that could be convergent, but just not convergent adding the direction at infinity that we want. And so like colloquially, we call these uh, integrals trapped. And so here, um, it might seem that we're stuck, but in fact, we can go a little bit further. So yeah, in some unpublished work of Gareth Elitis and Kashaev, um, these can be dealt with with a so-called untrapping procedure. So here, yeah, basically we apply uh, a Fourier transform identity to the Fideyev quantum dial logarithm. And this will decouple this Gaussian form from the Fideyev. And then we just have a Gaussian integral. So then we can just perform the Gaussian integral and we're left with some other Fideyev uh, and some other integral that's left. And so here in this example, if you applied uh, an untrapping procedure, uh, then you would reduce down to an integral of this form. So now we've turned our two into a three divided by eight. And so in this, if we have a product, if we just have one for day of times a Gaussian, basically we want the number in front of the X squared to be between uh, minus one and zero. And if that's the case, uh, then, sorry, minus half and zero. 
Uh, and if that's the case, then it'll be untrapped. And so here we've achieved that. Um, okay. And so there's an, the analogous, I mean, with these state integrals, they're really very analogous to the Q series themselves or these proper Q hypergeometric um, series. Uh, and so if you see something like this happening for state integral, there should be some analogous uh, thing happening for the Q series. And there is. And so, yeah, the Fourier, the analog of the Fourier transform identity for the Fedeev is the Q binomial theorem. And so we can apply a similar, um, a similar method to this Q series here. And then we would write, instead of uh, getting a Gaussian integral, we would find uh, theta functions appearing, which again, makes sense as a natural analog for the Gaussian integral, of course. Um, and so then we can write these series as sort of combinations of, again, simpler series here. Uh, now, okay, I had to introduce an I and that's because of the three over eight, but so some functions like this, so basically that I could be, you know, one minus one, I minus I, uh, all of those will come into play. And then we'll take these series and there'll be a product of these with a bunch of theta functions and that will sort of reproduce our first series. And the, the point now is that these simpler series down here, sort of the analog of being untrapped for the Q series is that we have a Q hypergeometric sum that makes sense both when Q is less than one and when Q is greater than one. The other way you could think about it is if I send Q to, my, to Q inverse, I want that Q inverse series to be a convergent Q series. Uh, and so we can apply, basically, if there's some untrapping that can happen at the state integral, there's a similar thing that will happen for these Q series. Uh, and so then it's quite good because we sort of can, there's natural ways to extend these theta functions from Q being less than one. Uh, so we have a bit more freedom um, with these theta functions and we can sort of make sense of an extension of these things. Uh, and so then, yeah, so then once we've done this sort of untrapping, uh, we can apply the, the method that I mentioned before, basically pushing the contour to infinity for these state integrals. And you will reproduce these kind of series, uh, these simplified series down here. And then you can go back. So you sort of do the untrapping at the level of the state integral, and then you undo it at the level of the Q series. And so you can rewrite your state integral in terms of the original uh, Q series without all of these sort of messy theta functions and stuff floating around. Um, okay. So that's sort of the structures that go into factorizing the state integrals into Q series. Uh, and so then the other case that I mentioned was factorizing them at rationals. Uh, and so this uses the sort of following nice lemma. So if you have uh, you know, a function on some uh, domain that has some translational invariance, uh, then if we consider this function shifted in, with this uh, translation we're interested in divided by the original, um, if this quotient uh, is invariant under the shift, uh, then we can rewrite this integral uh, in the following way. So we take the integral, this contour, some contour here, f of z, and we can rewrite it as the difference between two contours of the same form, f of z dz, but divided by one minus g of z. Okay. Um, and so this is quite nice because now our contour um, is sort of, if we think, okay, so the contours that we're going to take for state integrals, this gamma is going to be the reals and the shift is going to be i times some integer. And so then we've sort of trapped a region between two contours. Um, however, we've introduced some potential poles with this one minus g of z. But actually this is quite nice in the examples of the state integrals because exactly you know, if we take the higher dimensional analog of this lemma, um, these one minus g's that will appear and could give rise to poles, um, the equation g equals g of z equals one is exactly uh, in examples will be exactly the gluing equations um, that we had before. So then what we see is when we try and factorize these state integrals at rational points, 
at the rational numbers, um, then we get a sum over essentially the critical points um, of uh, the, yeah, the original uh, series just using this sort of residue theorem. So this is quite nice. And so in the example that I gave before, so this integral, this state integral that we introduced with Marcos, Gia and Stavros, um, you can apply the fundamental lemma to can, or this lemma that I just gave to uh, compute the uh, state integral at rationals. And so here you find a uh, quite nice result. So you see in a similar way, if you remember the factorization for Q series, we saw this G2 function appeared out the front of this factorization. And so here the G2 is replaced by this J. Uh, and this J is the Kashaev invariant of the figure eight knot. Uh, and then we get some sort of uh, homogeneous corrections to this. Uh, and we see some sort of volumes, the figure eight not appearing. So these V1 and V2 are sort of the volume and the minus the volume of the figure eight. Um, and anyway, so then we can rewrite this in terms of these series. And so here, these other terms um, are given by similar kind of expressions to the Kashaev invariant, however, defined over uh, a number field. And so here, these they're defined over this square root of minus three field or some Kummer extensions of this. Um, so this, uh, and so we can completely calculate this integral in terms of these exact uh, formulae. Uh, and this is quite nice because then uh, these exact formulae, if we sort of pair them together, we can learn things about this bilinear combination uh, just from studying the original integral itself. Um, okay. So that's sort of the state integrals, how you factorize them as Q series and at rationals. Um, and so now let's get into the quantum modularity. So just to remind us, I'm sure there's, I feel like there's been many talks about uh, similar things. So, but I'll just be very brief. So just what are modular forms or how could we think about them in the context of this? So uh, we'll be interested, I mean, these uh, quantum modular forms will appear for these kind of examples, they'll all be vector valued. So let's just think, let's just recall what a vector valued modular form would be. So in particular, uh, if we have a representation of SL2Z into uh, yeah, GLNC, for example, uh, then a function from the upper half plane to C to the N uh, is a modular form for this representation of weight K if it satisfies you know, the following equation. So if we take the, you know, the action of SL2Z on the upper half plane by Mobius uh, transformations, then if this A, B, C, D matrix is in SL2Z, then we should expect the function to transform by just the product of uh, this vector uh, times the representation, and then with some weight factor appearing this C tau plus D to the K. And more generally, that uh, weight factor could be just an automorphy factor. So we could have a little factor of its own, but um, anyway. So a classic example of this is the theta functions. So here, if we take this uh, triple of theta functions, then uh, we can understand the action of the modular group on this vector uh, very easily. Um, so if we shift, so if these are the two, these two um, equations I'll give here are basically the generators of SL2Z, the T and S matrix, or the one, one, zero, one, and one, zero, uh, sorry, zero, one, minus one, zero, or the other sign, as you like. Um, and we can completely describe them like this. Uh, and so this is how we could think of a module form. There should be some growth condition at infinity, but okay, it should satisfy some simple equations like this. Okay, so then uh, how, like what, so how do we go from this to a quantum modular form? So uh, Zagier introduced this notion of quantum modular forms uh, around 2010, um, because there were certain behaviors that uh, kept cropping up in various examples of sort of special functions. Uh, and so uh, Zagier's article didn't quite give a definition, but it gave a list of interesting examples. Um, and we've already seen one of them, but we'll see it again. But so the main idea is that 
instead of insisting equality for these modular transformations, we sort of insist something a bit weaker. So the original version of this quantum modularity started with a function from the rational numbers to the complex numbers, say. Um, and this is called a quantum modular form of weight K if we take, when we take the difference of the function and uh, you know, minus you know, C to the tau plus D to the K times the original function, um, this is a quantum module form if it's better behaved than the original function. So the original function just could be a complete mess, completely discontinuous, uh, no rhyme or reason. But when we take this difference, we want this to be somehow better. So, you know, in an ideal situation, maybe it's analytic on R minus a bunch of points. Um, uh, but we could insist, we could ask for less. And the first, you know, so the most interesting example of Zagier's article did ask for less. Uh, and so this was the Kashaev invariant of the figure eight, which we saw before, which came from the factorization of that state integral. Um, so if we take the logarithm of this Kashaev invariant, then we can look at these plots. So these are plots from Zagier's article from 2010. So if we plot this logarithm, uh, this, by the way, this J of X is uh, real valued. Um, just out of luck about this not has extra symmetries. Um, but okay, so this is a graph of what the function looks like from Zagier's article. And you can see it's, you know, you can see some structures, but mostly it's a bit of a mess. Um, and so then if we take now the difference, uh, or here we take, you know, let's take a quotient and then take a log of the difference as you like. Um, we don't know, this is better for branching issues. Um, but so now if we take uh, the quotient of these two functions, uh, one evaluated x and one evaluated one minus x, take the log, uh, then we see this is a much nicer looking uh, graph. It's still uh, discontinuous at each rational, but if you approach any rational number from the left, then you will see sort of a full asymptotic uh, expansion. So one way to say this is that it's C infinity from the left and right at each rational point, um, but discontinuous at the rational point itself. Um, okay. So this example uh, led Zagier to make this quantum modularity conjecture, which stated that for hyperbolic knots, um, their Kashaev invariants uh, quant should be quantum modular forms uh, in this sense. Uh, and so then, um, yeah, these asymptotic series I was mentioning as you approach from the left and right at each rationals, these are sort of versions of uh, this series I introduced originally, this phi m of h bar. And so this series, I sort of introduced just one uh, special example of this series, uh, but, and this is essentially the asymptotics of this invariant as we send roots of unity uh, to one, uh, but you have asymptotic series when you send roots of unity to any other root of unity uh, of this Kashaev invariant. Uh, and so you get a whole family of these asymptotic series. And so at each of these different rationals, you sort of get series associated to these other series, um, but they're all sort of determined uh, by each other in a sense. Uh, and those functions that I gave before, let's see, that's kind of further back. Yeah. So these J sub I functions for I equal one and two, uh, these are sort of the constant terms of these asymptotic series at other roots of unity. But so you can extend that to a full uh, yeah, asymptotic series, but they're just the sort of constants. Um, but anyway, so yeah, we get these nice asymptotic series everywhere. Uh, but then the question is, so we saw that these uh, state integrals could be factorized uh, into sort of combinations of these functions. Um, and we know that they should all have asymptotics. And so how they'll relate to each other. Um, uh, so this we'll see in a little bit, but uh, yeah, first I wanna talk, of, I wanna show how you could prove um, this kind of quantum modularity in many examples. Um, and so just before doing that, so the example I'll actually do is a Q series, not one of these functions at roots of unity, like the Kashaid invariant. Um, 
And so here, one way you could define a quantum modular form for Q series is you look at sort of horizontal asymptotic. So instead of, uh, if we take tau in the upper half plane, instead of sending tau to I infinity uh, and taking, you know, the function evaluated at minus one on tau, so sending sort of this Q tilde to one, uh, you could send it horizontally to infinity. So sort of along a horosphere uh, and then, the Q corrections, so these E of tau corrections, they'll all be sort of roughly of the same order. And so then you can really make sense of uh, a full series corrections asymptotically. So in particular, it would be nice that maybe if you take the quotient of, you know, the Q series evaluated the Q tilde uh, and, the Q, and the Q series itself, uh, then if you take these horizontal asymptotics, uh, if this has a nice asymptotic series, then you could uh, define this as a quantum modular form in a similar way to these functions uh, evaluated at the rationals. Uh, but anyway, okay, so then uh, how would you prove this? So the main uh, tools you need to prove this is of course, studying the properties of the Pockhammer symbol or the Fidea quantum dial algorithm. And so the first, so yeah, the figure eight uh, knot in this example of the Kashai invariant, this was proved by Garifalidis and Zagier using sort of positivity of this sum. Uh, as I mentioned, it was real valued and yeah, positive. Uh, and so this uh, was then generalized uh, by Betton and Drapeau for like 10 or so hyperbolic knots. Um, and the sort of main tool, as I said, is to study the modularity properties of the Pockhammer symbol itself. Uh, which basically are just the properties of the Fidea of quantum dial algorithm. And so here, the main tool you need to use is this formula of Voronwitz, um, which rewrites, so this uh, infinite product, these two Pockham symbols on the left, this is related to the Fidea of quantum dial algorithm. Um, and then on the right, we have this nice uh, integral expression here uh, that we can uh, yeah, rewrite the left-hand side with. And so this left-hand side only makes sense when um, tau is in the upper half plane, uh, but this right-hand side makes sense more generally. And so we can use this to uh, study the Pockhammer symbol at roots of unity, uh, if we like, or also in the upper half plane. Um, and so then the way we use this is we start with our, start with our Q-hyper geometric sum, and then we look at our Pockhammer symbol and we rewrite it uh, as follows. So we pull out basically these integral expressions appearing here, um, the die logarithm, the integral of the logarithm, we put them inside this phi function here and we pull them out and we replace the kth Pockhammer by uh, this Pockhammer symbol evaluated at sort of the floor of k divided the real part of one over tau. Okay. And then uh, we just keep rewriting. So we start splitting this sum up into pieces. So we, we take our original sum and now we break it into basically the parts determined by this flaw in the argument of the Pockhammer symbol. Uh, and then we start pulling out factors of Q that appear and rewriting this Q tilde uh, in terms of uh, some sort of small parameter X. And this sum now We've sort of, if we keep, if we pull out all of the Q dependence, uh, then we're just left with the sum over a compact sort of integral with, as we send tau to infinity, it gets sort of the number of terms in that compact interval is getting more and more and more. Um, and so then we can reduce the problem now to understanding the asymptotics of this sum that is left. Okay, so then the sort of last thing to note is that when we go from the second last equation to the last, uh, we've basically introduced this J parameter here. So if we take some integer J, um, so we, that means that we shift sort of uh, some factor of Q at the front, but it also shifts this uh, sum that we have inside here the, over this sort of compact interval. Um, and that's important because when we try and apply a summation method to the second sum and then try and apply stationary phase, the particular J that we choose will be important um, for actually being able to apply a stationary phase approximation. So this, this is quite nice because being able to apply the stationary phase approximation sort of picks out um, a J for us. Uh, and this sort of determines 
uh, essentially uniquely the 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 sort of correct uh, correction in these Q uh, this Q series here on the left. Uh, and so there, yeah, in these class of examples, you can prove that this um, these series uh, where a is some integer, you can prove that these are quantum modular forms in this sense. So if we take uh, if we evaluate this Q series at you know, minus one on tau and send tau horizontally to infinity, um, then it will have a Q series correction given by the same function uh, multiplied by a nice asymptotic series. Um, and so this is kind of nice, but uh, we'd actually like a little more um, because as, I, as we saw previously, these uh, quantum modular forms, although they're getting better, they're still yeah. sort of discontinuous at each rational, which is not uh, sort of the nicest kind of function. It's better, but sort of not, still not so nice. Um, and so to get this better, we need to refine the original modularity conjecture. Uh, and so this was sort of done over the last 10 years in work of Garifalidis and uh, Zagier. Um, and so basically the main issue with the original version of the quantum modularity conjecture was that we should have been taking these sort of bilinear combinations, but we just took the largest term and divided by some other term uh, on the asymptotics. And so therefore it, we essentially just ignored all exponentially small corrections. Uh, and so in a sense, I mean, we'll see in a bit, but the, you know, we were dividing entries of matrices when we should have been dividing matrices. Uh, and so to get that improved uh, version, we should work a little harder. Um, and so this is of course best done with Grower summation, but um, Garofalidis and Zagier originally used sort of some smooth version of optimal truncation. So to do this, you need a bit more information about the series. I mean, for Brewery summation, of course, we know the kind of uh, structures that you need on the asymptotic series and you need the same sort of things for this optimal truncation. Um, and so if you use this kind of resummation, then when you look at the asymptotics, instead of just dividing the left-hand side by this J uh, to see the asymptotic series phi, we take a difference where we replace phi now by you know, the smooth optimal truncation or later the Brewer resummation. Uh, and then we see new asymptotics. And so, as I said, this sort of indicates that this J should be lifted from just a number. It should be part of either a vector or a matrix. Um, and so the matrix perspective is the nicest, of course, because you can't divide vectors by vectors, but you can divide matrices by matrices. Um, and so the, uh, what happens in practice is you start with this uh, function J or you know, any uh, of these sort of QHub geometric functions. And you wanna realize this as part of a matrix of similar objects. And so this matrix will be indexed by uh, some sort of basis of an associated Q difference equation. All of these hypergeometric functions have nice Q difference equations that they solve, or they're in families that solve Q difference equations. And um, uh, the, so this is one index of the matrix. And then another index is given by sort of uh, objects associated to the critical points of these functions. So the sort of gluing equations that we saw originally. Um, so in, in exactly what this index should be in general, it's not quite known. So if you have gluing equations that have that are zero dimensional, so a zero dimensional set of solutions, sorry, uh, then this is just indexed by these points. Uh, but more generally, yeah, as I said, it's probably related to something like the number of periods or something, but uh, this is sort of some ongoing work at the moment. So at least for a zero dimensional set of solutions, this is indexed clearly by these. Uh, and then the, this, matri this matrix now should satisfy a sort of matrix version of our modularity where now this, uh, before we just had a representation row, uh, but now we have this function omega and this omega should satisfy better properties. For example, be analytic, um, on a cut plane, so extend analytically. Uh, and this is much nicer than just having C infinity from the left and right at each rational point. And so this is sort of a nice better structure. 
And this, uh, these kind of statements we can really prove uh, using state intervals. Um, and yeah, so for the example of the figure eight, you know, we had these functions from before, so this Kashaib invariant, and then some similar kind of functions here. Uh, and we can put these into a matrix as follows. Uh, and this would be the kind of matrix that we'd be considering uh, for these uh, yeah, modularity properties. And so in this example of the figure eight knot, um, yeah, this we proved uh, satisfied these sort of uh, matrix valued uh, versions of this quantum modularity in this very strict sense, uh, which is called holomorphic quantum modularity. And so this was proved in a bunch of works with uh, yeah, Gareth Leitas Gu, Kashaev, Mourinho, uh, myself and Zagier. Um, and so, as I said, you basically prove this using the state integrals um, and a certain duality associated with uh, the Q difference equations that are floating around for these um, intervals. Basically, you need to rewrite a, a certain inverse matrix in terms of some other functions. So the sort of L, the L functions that appeared before you, the L J functions, if you recall, um, these appear as some inverse uh, or entries of the inverse matrix of this J function here. Um, and so you need this, and then you use analytic properties of this for day of. So this for day of quantum dialogarithm uh, is analytic on a cut plane. And you basically use that to show that the, the state integral itself uh, is analytic. And then when you rewrite uh, this omega in terms of the state integrals, then this gives you the proof. Uh, and so another example is this uh, trapped state integral that we had before. Um, so these are also uh, holomorphic quantum modular forms. Um, and the proof is essentially the same. I mean, you have to do this untrapping procedure, but uh, again, you just rewrite them in terms of state intervals and then you're done. Okay. So then we're interested in how this relates to resurgence. And so I'm pretty much almost out of my time. So, uh, let me just sort of briefly give you the conjectures and then uh, give you a quick blurst through an example. Um, okay, so how this all relates to resurgence uh, was given or was sort of understood in work of Gareth Leiter's Gu uh, Mourinho. Uh, and then they, they basically showed that, or they conjectured that uh, these, so they had numerical, uh, evidence to show with their conjectures that um, these state integrals appear to be the Borel resummation of uh, the these asymptotic series that were appearing from these gluing equations. Um, and so certain combinations of these state integrals, so certain combinations are sort of the hard bit, that's where you have to sit down and do the numerical computations and work out what these combinations are. Um, but in practice, this can seemingly always be done. <clears throat> so we can rewrite the Borel resummation of these series in terms of these state integrals. Um, so the fact that these are Borel resummable was conjectured by Stavros, you know, 10 years prior. Um, and so the structure of the Borel resummability of these uh, series is also very well understood. Again, uh, appeared in Stavros's paper where he conjectured this sort of resurgence for these um, asymptotic series. And so the, the branch cuts of these series appear in these peacock patterns. Um, basically you have these towers, uh, which appear as differences as sort of the values of these critical, these critical values of the asymptotic series. Um, and if you package these all up, uh, we also they also give uh, Gareth Leitas, Guen Mourinho also give conjectures about sort of the structure of the Stokes phenomenon. So at each of these uh, Stokes lines, um, they expect that this jumping that should appear as we sort of perform the Borel transform or the Laplace transform across these uh, branch cuts uh, should just be given by sums of a sort of nice packet of asymptotic series. Uh, where we have sort of a Q correction and then just some integral coefficients. Uh, and so this is, this conjecture is very strong because in practice we can really use it to compute 
Um, and so if we look at this example, a specific example from that family that I had before. Um, so if we look at this Q series, uh, then we can look at this asymptotic series that it has. So here it has some asymptotics of this form. Uh, so that we have this exponential singularity with this dilogarithm value. Uh, you know, we have this pre-factor here, this one is square root of delta. It's in this number field, this quartic number field. And then the first few coefficients you can compute um, as follows, just by doing sort of standard Gauss integral. Um, and so if we start with these functions, we can really just evaluate them at points and then divide by, we can do a numerical Borelli summation uh, of this asymptotic series, or uh, the asymptotic series we expect to appear there. Um, we can divide by this, and then we can just start peeling off Q's uh, corrections, Q corrections to the asymptotic series. And so we start keep going and going, and then uh, we can recognize these corrections as sort of a value of our original function. Uh, and then we can keep going and we just start pulling off more series. So then we, we completely pull out one of the asymptotic series out of the four that come from this quartic field. And we can keep doing this for the others as well. And we find these Q series corrections to each of those asymptotic series. Uh, and this leads us to a sort of conjectural identity of this form where we have the original function at Q tilde equals, you know, our Borelli summation times these Q series corrections. And so we can do that just above the positive reals and we can do it just above the negative reals and we find two different expressions. And so then we can sort of compute the difference uh, between those Q corrections uh, using uh, this sort of, you know, the formula just above the reals and just above, uh, sorry, just above the positive reals and just above the negative reals. And we just basically take a quotient of those two terms uh, where we use the original conjecture to say these Borelli summations should just be the state integrals uh, that we had before. And we can factorize the state integrals so we can rewrite the whole thing as a big product of this form. And in the end, reduce it just to a Q series. So in particular, this F matrix is just, you know, the first column is given by these little F functions that we saw before, but then you extend this to a full matrix. And in the end, you write this nice, um, you can write this nice formula for a generating series of Stokes constants. And so in this example, you know, the first few coefficients are given by this. Um, and yeah, so this is super powerful. You can do it for many Q hypergeometric functions and um, you can, yeah, apply this to many, many, like all of the quantum invariants uh, associated to SL2, are sort of these proper Q hypergeometric expressions, as you can always apply these methods to not just for knots, you can also do it for closed manifolds. And so in my thesis, I did this uh, for a particular closed manifold um, relating WIT and Z hat invariants. Um, uh, but yeah, so Sorry for going over, um, you know, bon courage for all of you. You did very well. <laughs> Thanks for coming.